For this lecture, I want to talk a little bit more in depth than what the book goes into, talking about colonialism and how that served to create such a large rich versus poor divide in the world, particularly from the advantages that the Western Europeans had. The Western European expansion, we'll pick it up primarily around year 1500, well, the Western Europeans began to exert their power and influence throughout the world, just a handful of states that became very successful and powerful. But by the early 20th century, about a dozen Western empires controlled about three-fourths of the entire global economy and had set in what we call this north-south divide, rich versus poor world. And this is a, rec a reflection of this Western Euro European control and influence. And even though this was a major reason as to why we have this in the world today, well, since the end of colonialism, we still see that the poor countries are having a hard time developing and can't be blamed on this colonial period to an extent that it used to. The, the further we go along and the states continue to have trouble developing, well, there's other reasons that are blocking them and primarily, as we've already talked about, that centers around their political stability or lack of it. This period that we'll be talking about came in two basic phases, colonization, we could say approximately 1500 to 1800. This is when the Western European states were becoming very competitive and very powerful, very innovative. They had lots of head starts that we'll talk about in being able to develop technology to make them more powerful. They also formed what were called these joint stock companies that were tasked to go out into the world and discover and to bring back resources back to the home country. This is through the process of mercantilism that we've already talked about. So they were exploiting the native resources and the labor from these areas where they would go in order to bring back that wealth to the home country. Then around 1800, up until around World War II, first of all, these joint stock companies had be started to get fairly large, unwieldy, corrupt, bureaucratic. Even Adam Smith one of the things that inspired him to write Wealth of Nations was these, this mercantilist system of these joint stock corporations and how politicians had started to become stooges to these big, huge joint stock companies. So what they did around this time is shifted gears and turned it into political control where the colonies then became part of their empire. So they basically just took them over, appointed royal governors that would go down there and rule the native country. This is an example of how the British Empire extended around the world, around World War I, and this doesn't even include their holdings that they had before American independence and things like that, but British Empire was the biggest, but wasn't the only one. Several other empires, whether it was Spanish, of course, had given up a lot of their territory prior to this, but French hadn't had an empire, Germans had had an empire, the, the Danish, very successful empire. So there was competition for these Western, Western European states to go out and do this. Now, when you talk about what might be the most important innovation to humankind, you could probably answer that as farming. Because around 10,000 years ago, at the end of the Ice Age, humans had migrated all around the planet and had been started to get separated up into their own various cultures. But the domestication of plants and animals is probably the single most important innovation or development that resulted in modern civilization as we know it, because once humans started to stick together in one place for a while using farming in order to um, survive, 
then we started to see communities start to develop. And as a result of these communities starting to develop, we started to see more intense populations, which required lots of other things to happen in order for them to coexist together and survive together. You know, population intensification also developed more immunities to diseases because of being around other people and other animals. Then if you stayed and built a community through farming, then you would eventually build up surplus food that you could then trade, and then you'd have to figure out how to protect it and how to dole it out. So lots of other things started to come up out of this, political systems most importantly, and then specialization of labor started to build this community. Not everybody had to be farmers, so then therefore you could develop other occupations and other responsibilities and other jobs. Therefore, we start to see the beginnings of complex society, modern civilization as we know it. So that's very important development now, as we move ahead to around, well, Middle Ages, we've talked a little bit already about how the modern state formed with the decline of feudalism. The Europeans, that's the primary advantage is that that's where the states actually, the first modern states formed, and they became very hyper-competitive, very innovative, very powerful, able to successfully cooperate within their state and then use that for development. We we're also looking at the Renaissance and the Reformation, which a lot of new ideas were coming about. But also in Europe, they had the proper climate zones for four seasons that would develop their agricultural industry. And as a result of that, lots of economic revolution that was geared around the agricultural industry, increases in production and, and work, crop rotation, able to trade these products, and then as a result, we build up the mercantile business community, which starts to take precedence as we start to merge into this system of, of capitalism starting to form. So these all centered there in the European region and started to give them tremendous advantages over the rest of the world, whether it's through the formation of these states, which then focused its uh, interests on building up their economic development that facilitated even more innovation, more competition, more conflict as well, as we've talked about, that resulted in several wars as well as the Treaty of Westphalia that established the concept of sovereignty so that now we have these modern states. So this is where the political fragmentation came about, decentralized authority, Authority really motivated the political competition for these states to develop, going out, like I said, using that system of mercantilism, mercantilism to go out and bring home the resources to the home country. And these territorially defined authorities that we talked about that were so important for forming the modern state, they tended to mitigate these deputies uh, tisms and these kings and rule by religious dogma started to mitigate that. Also, the concept of property rights, another one of these institutions that had been forming for a long time, also dovetailed into the concept of uh, market systems and eventually to capitalism, which the states were very much interested in pursuing in order to grow and develop and get more powerful. By 1500, the more developed civilizations were relatively dense populations possessing multiple assets and advantages, domestic animals, swing plows, plows, carts, and above all, towns. So what we're looking at here is political development as much as anything else that's organizing this into making it more successful, comparatively speaking. The Incas or the Mayas, for example, in the South American region, which we'll look at here in a second, for example, had no knowledge of the wheel, the arch, cart, or metallurgy iron. So let's talk about a specific example of this, these clash of civilizations. 
around 1532 when Pizarro landed in what is now Peru. Very quick confrontation there with the locals where Pizarro was greeted by the, the emperor of that region, Altawapa, but Pizarro immediately kidnapped him and held him for ransom for all the gold that he could get out of the region. And the bottom line here is that the differences between these the, the natives and this visiting group here were so extreme, and this happened all over the region. It also had happened earlier with the Cortez and what is now Mexico. But the bottom line is that Pizarro landed with 168 Spaniards and within one day defe defeated 80,000 natives in that uh, immediate vicinity. These 80,000 natives were all within about a mile or so of where he landed. The Spaniards had enormous advantages. Of course, of all, they had the, the maritime technology that enabled them to sail across the ocean to come over there to look for things like gold and, and luxuries. They also had horses, which frightened the natives because the natives had never seen these big animals before. And perhaps most of all, they had steel, steel swords and armor. They literally sliced through the natives like butter when they were spending that day taking over that region. The natives were paralyzed, literally, after Altawapa had been captured because due to their religious or their particular superstitions, were raised to believe that he was somewhat of a deity or a, a god on earth. And, and when he was so easily captured, then they, they just were helpless. Also, they did not have any information. There's no way of knowing what to expect because only about 10 years, less than 10 years previous, Cortez had done basically the same thing, but there was no spread of information. There's no way of of passing on knowledge that uh, they would have able to have been prepared for that or at least uh, been forewarned, things like that. So it was just an incredible clash that exemplified how the Western Europeans could come over and then literally just dominate these entire regions. And what this book also refers to as well here is that because the Western Europeans had been living together in communities with domesticated animals. They had developed resistances to various diseases. And the, probably the single biggest threat to the natives were, was disease. There were many regions that were decimated, much as 80 to 90 percent of the entire population was wiped out by things such as smallpox. So the Europeans had advantages and were able to conquer the world as a result of these, but not necessarily because they were smarter, but because they could best take advantage of the principle that many heads are better than one. So the culture of any of these conquering nations of Europe, such as Britain, is in fact a greatest hits collection of inventions assembled across thousands of miles and years. In contrast to that, the insular or the isolated cultures had to make do with few of their own homegrown technologies because they had not gotten the benefit of shared knowledge, the spread of information that had gone through Europe that provided this competition and innovation. So some of the examples of the inventions that were borrowed by the Western Europeans, which they then made full advantage of, cereal crops, alphabetic writing that they borrowed from the Middle East, gunpowder, bullets, paper, printing, tea, came from China, domesticated horses, actually it originated in Ukraine, things like a written language, even some concepts of math had come from the Olmecs, which originated in the what is now the Mexico region. Some of their own European invention that helped take them to the next level, things such as the water wheel, taking rotary motion to reciprocating motion, 
eyeglasses, which became very crucial to craftsmen as well as to reading to create more intricate, intricate instruments. The mechanical clock, you may not think that that's such a big deal, but once the clock became a standard piece of uh, equipment, then that brought more order and control and, and time and deadlines into making a more organized society even more productive. And then movable type, I don't think there's a whole lot of argument that the printing press invented um, around 14, mid 1400s or so is probably the single biggest invention in human history because of what it was able to do by delivering information, sharing of information, increasing the ability for more and more people to get knowledge in order to progress and compete with other people that are getting this knowledge as well. A few other things that were developing around that time, even when we look at the early state system and the transition to capitalism from feudalism, Judeo-Christian values did seem to dovetail into that fairly conveniently That because one of the things that was a concern by the early Enlightenment thinkers or the Renaissance thinkers is that when we start to move towards more enlightenment of self-interest and letting the individual work to su succeed and make, make money, well, there was the fear that the religious dogma that had been in control for so many centuries prior to that was going to be against that. Well, particularly with the Protestant Reformation, there was a little bit more preference for individual works. Once those transitions started to happen, the Judeo-Christian work ethic started to give more emphasis protection to private property. The idea, particularly after the Reformation, that earthly rulers are not free to do as they pleased, more respect for the manual labor of the individual to do a good job and get rewarded for it, and then this concept of a Protestant work ethic, more pride and value in this concept called good works of achievement, and then the calling. Once you are in an occupation, then that's, that's your calling, and you are obligated to do well at it. Interesting quote here talking about how the Western Europeans came to dominate while the Dutch and the English were scouring the ends of the world for raw materials and markets, the Ottomans and the Chinese, by far more powerful entities, had both withdrawn into a doomed quest for self-sufficiency. So those two empires looked more inward while the Western Europeans were out spreading over the earth. Some of the major differences here that propelled the Western world, and this is another thing we can call West versus the rest, or North versus the South is what it's typically called. In our class, we'll just, for in today's context, we just call it rich versus poor, because we've got a clear delineation between the couple of dozen or so richest countries in the world, and then everybody else, not, not all that um, rich. So this concept of competition where once these regions became politically fragmented, and because of some of these other motivations that I've talked about, the ancestors of the modern business corporations came from that. With respect to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment period, there was massive scientific revolution during this period in that region. Major breakthroughs in math, astronomy, physics, chemistry, bio biology, all centered around the scientific method, empi empirical inquiry. So it's uh, hard to even calculate how valuable that was in innovating and taking humanity to the next level, improving standards of living. Yes, we all want that. Unfortunately, these states that became so successful and so powerful, they kind of used that to go out and conquer the rest of the world. So uh, they kind of did it because they could. You know, we 
not looking at it here from the perspective of good, bad, right, or wrong. This is just how it happened. And now every other society in the entire world would like to emulate what they had discovered. Also, the value of the rule of law, respect for rule of law, and representative governments, again, based on private property rights and individual liberties. This is the central theme here of of liberalism that came out of the Enlightenment period where human beings were starting to take it to the next level of trying to figure out how can we govern ourselves rather than have to deal with these, these empires and these kings and this religious dogma. In addition, as we get closer to the 20th century, modern medicine made enormous breakthroughs in, in the Western societies because of how much further uh, advanced and developed they were with their technology. In the consumer society is another advantage that because we are developing the capacity to make products that make our lives better, then we want to go out and buy those products. So that eventually led to the Industrial Revolution, probably the central most prolific period of technological innovation in human history, and then increasing demand for more goods, cheaper goods that we can make cheaper, make more profitable, things like that. And then I've already talked about this, this work ethic that came out of the Western you know, expansionist societies and you know, intensive labor with higher savings rates. This is permitting more sustained capital accumulation. Now, again, we're not saying what's right, wrong, good, or bad. We're saying what came out of the Western societies that helped to make them so successful in their development of higher standards of living for, for human beings that most other societies would like. For the next few chapters, we'll be talking about this North versus South difference or rich versus poor difference, the world average of GDP per capita is around 13,000 and there are a handful of very rich states that are dramatically higher than the world average and then the overwhelming majority of most states are clearly below that average. So we'll be looking at that for the next uh, few lectures here talking about the rich versus poor divide, as well as what are the obstacles to economic development for the poor countries. Summing it up here, Western capitalism, again, we're not saying what system is right, what system is wrong. We're just saying that, comparatively speaking, the Western capitalism has been quite successful, and now we are seeing, as we've already talked about, the entire global system is moving towards capitalism pretty much by default because it has survived and has been relatively successful. So the typical claim is that Western ideals have been exported to the world by imperialism. Yes, some has to a degree. Globalization, yes, quite a bit so. Electronic media, most definitely, as we become more technologically advanced, we can communicate more of this around the world. But there is more to it than this. Western societies have been good at providing things that human beings want. They got there first. They did a pretty good job of making some things that a lot of human beings want. Just a few examples. Clean water, medicine to make us live longer, food so that we can survive, transportation, communication, nice clothes, nice cars, popular music, on and on and on and on. These things were developed by the Western societies because they could and because that's what people want. And then other cultures look at that and say, that looks like fun. That looks like a good idea. So there's profit to be made and appealing to global tastes. One of the reasons why it has continued to sustain itself. As far as long-term sustainability, if we keep consuming resources, yes, we could 
consume ourselves into extinct, extinction. So that also brings up other questions as to how this is going to play out, what societies might have to do to look at more sustainable or conservation type practices and how that might fit in to this Western capitalism. All right, so I wanted to just use this lecture to be able to expound a little bit on what is behind this rich versus poor world that we live in and how that kind of got locked into place pretty solidly to where it hasn't changed much in the last half a century or longer. So then we're going to start talking about other things that the poor countries are having to deal with in order to try to develop.